Good morning and welcome to our Live Talk program. This is Lloyd Garvey here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our Live Talk program covering wisdom for living on your Friday morning rise and shine and give God the glory. And this morning here, I'm looking at a topic, give me neither poverty nor riches, but convenience. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but convenience. So this is our process of meditation. As we look at the Proverbs, we move on into Proverbs chapter 30. So welcome again. Hopefully you had a blessed night rest. And thanks for joining me here this morning as we look at these beautiful words. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, I thank you again for the blessings of this day, for the blessings of your word, and for the blessings, your Lord, of being able to meditate upon these things and be blessed by them. May you be with us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. So, yeah, I'm looking here. <laughs> sorry, I'm looking here at this topic. Um, give me uh, neither poverty nor riches, but convenience. And this is taken from Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7 through 9. So we move into um, another chapter and the last um, two chapters of um, Proverbs um, um, bring forth some major teaching. And so we're going to go through them piece by piece. And especially when we get into Proverbs chapter 30, talking about the virtuous woman. I think that's a beautiful thing to kind of slow down into and um, get into it because it really describes both a virtuous man and a virtuous woman. So um, we're going to start here now by reading Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7 through 9. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7 through 9, very important lifestyle choice. It's a lifestyle choice and a choice you make, especially when you're young. Uh, how do you want to set your life? This is very important. It's the... It's the philosophy of life, I would call this. Give me neither poverty nor riches. So before I read that, read this. This is closing off this week where I talk about balance. And as you know, I was talking about balance all week and that it's never good to be in the extremes of life. And this text illustrates this very beautifully. Um, when you're real poor or real rich, it tend to run into a lot of problems. You know, when you're just pauperous or and begging, and when you are so rich that you become, as I say, filthy rich and literally filthy, um, it becomes a problem. And so, this week, as I say, I close off with a massive teaching here to me, very important because it, di it dictates if you live by it, it affects the quality, the type of life you live, the quality of life. And to me, being very poor and very rich to me affects your qu your quality of life in a very negative way, being convenient. Are living conveniently or in convenience in a convenient way <laughs> will make your life much better. So this is where we want to be, not in the left or the right, not in the rich or the poor, but right in the middle. And God will bless you in that endeavor. So I'll read it for you here. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7 through 9. Two things have, have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. So this is Proverbs chapter 30, verse 7 through 9. Very powerful passage of scripture that Basically, a capstone illustrates in a powerful way the, um, the the thought all week. It's important to live in within that balance, not to be at either extreme. As we start out in the week, we weave through the week. When people are at extremes, they tend to be live corrupt, wicked, foolish lives. We don't want to be like that. So, the verse 7 says, Two things have I desire of thee, deny me them not before I die. Mm, it's a request he's asking. It's a, it's a, it's, it's something like, uh, you know, I'm asking you something, uh, two wishes, you know, in the pagan world, they say, they go to the genie and they say, give me two wishes. And you would not think, as I say, if you go to a young person and say, if you had two things to ask of God or whatever, what would you ask? And people normally come up with various different things. In the Bible, this is probably one of the few things, and I'm going to show it in different places in the Bible where different patriarchs ask God this thing. It, it is it is a marvelous thing. You know, as I say, when you're a teenager, early 20s, you know, people ask God for silly things. But when you get older, 
you know some people never get get out of the 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 the, the the delusion but when you you're sensible you're walking with god you start to realize you know i don't want to be in the extremes of life um i don't desire the extremes of life it's just, just i want to be comfortable so that's why i say i'm gonna ask you two things god and don't deny me them so it, it's a very powerful request here don't deny me these two things before I die. That means he want to live until he dies and never experience the extreme. And that's powerful. Imagine most people, this would not be. Most people are yearning and desiring to win the lottery or to make it big in something. And most of the time, almost all the time, you see they crash and burn. But here, it's a story like the rich young ruler. We won't go to that passage, but that's one of those passages where the rich young ruler is so rich that he just denied Christ. He's just like, I can't do it. I have too much money. And this is where you don't want to be. So you just give me, just let me be convenient. Um, notice here, remove verse 8. Remove far from me vanity and lies. So that's number one. Yeah, I don't want to get into falsehood. I don't want to get into false doctrines. I don't want to get into false beliefs. I don't want to be deluded. I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to be tricked. I don't want to be telling tricks on people. I don't want to be conning people. I don't want to tell lies. I believe this is a very important thing. It's good to go through your life. And when you finish your year, um, you say, I didn't tell one lie. You know, you, you just just keep that away from me. I don't want to tell lies. I don't want to vanity. I don't want to live a vain, superfluous. I think I said that word wrong. But a, a very surface level, um, vapid ignorant life i don't want that so it says just keep far from me vanity and lies i don't want to i want to be a fake person i don't want to be a hypocrite and this is good for you to ask some people think you can't ask god these things it's good it is part of the biblical narrative that christ wants you to ask him it's a beautiful thing if you go to god and say hey god look don't deny me this please god you know just don't let me live a fake life don't let me be a hypocrite and a liar. That's okay to ask. There's a lot of things people, people say, oh, no, no, I don't want to ask that. No, it's okay. God loved that. <laughs> it's good that if you desire that you don't want to be a liar. In no way. You don't want to act lie, talk lie, behave lie. You just want to be f real. You want to be genuine. You know, you want to be just a, a decent, good person. That's okay. You know, there's people say, oh, no, you can't do that because that's working your way to heaven. Just ah, just get rid of these idiots. You can't listen to people like that. Sorry, I shouldn't use that word. But, you know, just you have to dismiss foolish people like that. I don't know. You go to seminary to come out and all you know how to come out and tell people to, that they can't ask God for something that all the prophets and patriots and Jesus, and I'll show you in a second, in a few minutes, want you to ask him. And I don't know how to miss this. It's okay for you to ask God for you to be a good person. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. So remove far from me. You know, just say, hey, Lord, just don't let me tell lies. He said, make it go. Go away. Far. Vanity and lies. Next thing. Second thing. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. So th these concepts to me are, are, are this philosophy here is to me the middle. He's saying, I don't want to poverty and i don't want riches and you think about it, that's a massive request because most people be like okay okay i can ask not to get the poverty but i you, what, do you, what do you mean you want me to ask not to be rich why would i ask that <laughs> and i know people the first thing that they might think about is hey look at david and solomon and I always remember remind people david and solomon was accounted for the destruction of israel so God says, look, you don't need to be like that. You just enjoy a good, convenient life. And to me, this is what it's all about. And I'm going to tell you in a second, some few minutes here, why I believe this is a massive philosophy from the Bible because it's the basis of the prophets, of the patriarchs, of the disciples. Convenience is better than, to me, better than having a whole boatload of a whole yacht load, put it that way, of stuff in this life. Because that in itself is inconvenient. Convenience is a different thing. Notice here, remove far from me vanity and lies and give me neither poverty nor riches, neither one. Just give me a balanced life. Feed me with 
food convenient for me. That means not too much, not too little. And you think about it, even when we flip over to health, when we flip over to spirituality, it is convenience. You know, there's some people, if they don't, if their food is not over, if everything is not over, they can't be satisfied. You know, if their pastor is not like buffoonish and jumping and making noise, they're not satisfied. Christ didn't say, and I'll get to it in a second, but Christ didn't say, all these thoughts are floating in my head. That's why I keep saying, I'll get to it in a second. <laughs> I can preach everything in about five minutes here. Christ didn't say, you know, give us, um, you know, exotic foods. He said, just give, pray for your daily bread. Just give me the food that I need for today, Jesus, and I'll be happy. And that to me is the, is the stuff of life. This is what makes life work when you're convenient. Convenience is a stuff of life. Now, I know people, it's obvious that poverty is a terrible thing. But many people lust after having too much. But if you get into your mindset of being just convenient, you put a limit on what truly happiness is. In other words, you know that if I just have somewhere comfortable sit, I'm fine. But you could have 10 places comfortable sit, but your buttocks can only go on one seat at a time. You don't need all that. You just need to have one seat that is very comfortable. And just give me bread that is convenient. As a matter of fact, I say this just, just because I, I'm supposed to be talking about wisdom for living that is very practical and teaches righteousness and self-control. I have a chair here that I'm sitting on at my desk as I speak to you. And it's one of the most comfortable chairs that I've found um in staples and i've been there for years and years and years looking for a chair and I, and and it's just my my back i guess i'm not one of those people that sit the most upright and I, at the moment i'm talking to you i'm upright so I'm, I'm working on it um and so for me i need a chair that's not flat in the back is and so all the chairs i've had over the years and i've always go looking for chairs looking online and you know there's these chairs that are like i think they call the aaron miller chairs they're more contour so i'm thinking thinking look come on man if aaron miller builds a chair that is contoured and all that why, why someone just don't build a cheap one or a reasonable price one let me say that and so finally i went one day and i found this chair that i'm sitting on now and it, it has a very nice contour it's more contoured like a car seat and I always say, I don't get it. Back in the past, they used to have just these flat, you know, bench seats in cars until they started doing bucket seats and they started doing seats that are more contour for your back. And I couldn't get it. So why somebody in the office chair business does, does, just go, go go to the people who do car manufacturing and just build a chair like a car manufacturer with the same contour and mold and just sell it as an office chair because normally you sit in your car seat Especially if it's like a SUV or van and it's upright, so your foot can be, your ties can be parallel to the floor. It's very com comfortable because it's contoured to the back. So you don't necessarily always have to get the thing that is the most expensive and costs thousands. You can get something that is not necessarily a $50 chair, but it's only a few hundred dollars and you can be very convenient. And especially like for what I do, I spend a lot of time seated and many of you listen to me you do that you know you're not working on your feet some of you work seated the the more uncomfortable chairs the more you could have back problem if you understand what i'm saying so in life there's a lot of things that this principle i'm just giving you one practical thing that it dictates sometimes is most of the time almost all the time is never the most expensive but and most of the time is never the cheapest it's a philosophy of life to just be convenient are convenienced. It's never, as I say, because you can be very convenient, convenient on a bed that costs a few hundred dollars if it's built right. Um, but most actually, if you buy a few thousand dollar bed, it should be, it should definitely be convenient. And so that's the issue in life. But sometimes people want to have so much that they can't use and or they want something that is so exquisite not because it's convenient because i've been in stuff where the thing is so expensive and it's so inconvenient i'm thinking who sits on that who used that this is nonsense but you don't buy it because it's convenient you buy it because it's exclusive it's exclusive and nobody else have it and you're going to show everybody that you're the only person that have it 
But you could have something that's very reasonable price and it's very convenient. It's for your use and you're very happy with it. And to me, convenience it can trump exclusivity and expensive or luxurious many times because they say there's many things out there that is very luxurious, but it's inconvenience. It's just totally inconvenience. It will inconvenience me. And, you know, it, that's it. So now let's go into some of this now. Uh, and I'll re review verse 9 also. It says, Let, Lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? And this is what you find is so that you can see why there's things are going to get worse in our society because the more people, um, it seems like the more money, more people say, Ah, oh, there's no God. And they get rude and obnoxious. So God's okay. I'll take away that money. And let's readjust your thinking. Um, because it's, money makes people prop, so full of themselves. Um, or lest I be poor and steal and take thy name, take the name of the Lord in vain. So it's this balance that one need to have. And when you're in that balance, it's just a good medium. And there, there, there is a person that has not the type of money that people, you know, not a millionaire, not a multimillionaire. And, and they're very happy, um, very convenient. They have everything that, um, that people who have way out of money have don't have i should say they don't have but they're quite happy and quite more convenient and that's the reality i've learned in life in my life personally i don't have to offer all of that to be convenient or to be convenienced but a person could have way more and they're just totally inconvenient so let's look at verse eight verse eight to me is the the the, the fulcrum it, it is this the Seven and nine sets it up and explains it, but verse eight is beautiful. So I'm going to give you uh, one, two, three, four translation here. Other people rendering other than the King James version, just to give you a three-dimensional view of verse eight. Um, and we're looking again at Proverbs thirty, and our main focal point is verse eight. Notice it says, "For uh, he says first, help me never tell a lie." So these are the two things he's asking. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. So that's another way to look at it. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. So the first thing he asks, help me never to tell a lie. All right. And we praise the Lord for that. We really pray for this. This is something I've, a principle I live by personally. And secondly, I really believe in this one again. Live by this. Give me just enough to satisfy my need. So if I have just enough to satisfy my need, I'm fine. When you're hungry, it's a terrible thing. Uh, it's a question I often ask people, and it's a literal question I ask you. Think about it. Uh, you can answer me, or you can text me and tell me. What is, what is, what, how do you feel when you're hungry? Now, over the years, I've realized different people feel different things when they're hungry. You know, people, some people's stomachs start to growl and rumble. Some people... They sort of feel faint. Some people, they feel physical pain in their stomach. Some people feel literal nothing. They just feel like, oh, I just need to eat. Um, I mean, everybody feels to eat, but different people feel different sensation within their stomach and their brain when they're hungry. So how do you feel when you're hungry? Another question could be asked is, how do you feel when you're full? Because different people feel different things when they're full. Some people feel nothing. They have to tell themselves, stop eating. Because they don't feel satisfied. Never do. So how do you feel? It's a very important thing to know. Because you'll be surprised. Go to work today. Ask people. How do they feel when they're hungry? You'll be surprised. Different people feel different things. Some people never thought about it. <laughs> they just eat because it's lunchtime. Or it's dinner time. So New Living Translation simply ends by saying, Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. That's one way to look at it. So keep that in mind. That's one dimension. Now dimension here. Is an English Standard Version. It says, remove far from me, falls with a line. Right? So far away. I don't want to have no falls with a line. Near. No faking. I don't want to be a fake person. Or help me go, God, to not be a fake person. And it says here, give me neither poverty nor riches. Same, same philosophy. It says now, feed me with food that is needful for me. So this is a different way to look at it needful so need is always the issue not so much my want but my need just give me what i need i need to get to work so i need a car 
right? I need to sleep, so I need a bed. I need to be able to sit down and relax and read a book, so I need a sofa. <laughs> Timothy, Paul doesn't go even that far. Paul, he don't need none of that. <laughs> he just needs some food and some cloth, clothing. So just my need, you know, and some of those needs, <laughs> it's it is it is debatable as they say. Um, bury and study Bible. Keep falsehood and deceit, deceitful words far from me. So you don't want to even. I don't want to even come into my thought. I need to lie. You know what I mean? It's just God. You know, daily I pray. God help me. I don't just let me just be always honest, honest with your word, honest with people, honest with circumstances. Judge right. Like you know, you hear me make certain presentation here that somebody could easily judge me one way. And I'm open to that, but I'm going to make my best effort that I'm judging others right. And others might disagree, but I make the best effort. I try to be on, on point with my judgment. And if I make a mistake, it's normally in the effort of trying to understand others and understand lifestyle, what's going on around me. So notice here, keep falsehood far away from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. So this is a balance. I don't want to be poor. So when he says, give me just food needful or before somebody renders it, satisfy my needs, he's saying basically, I'm full. I don't want to overeat. I don't want to undereat. You get it? I don't want to have basically money in my bank that, as I say, if you are if you have a thousand, if you have a billion dollars, if you spend a million dollars a year for the next, you'd have to have a thousand years to spend that. He said, I don't need that because that's unnecessary. I just want to be satisfied. And I want to be convenient. You see what I'm saying? Because I'm like, oh, this person is a billionaire. You think about it. If they liquidate all the assets, put it in an account that bear interest, and they live, they would have to live over a thousand years for them to spend that money at a million dollars a year clip. And if they spend even two million, three million, five million, it's just they would never be able to see that money spent. So he says, don't give me that. I don't need that. But don't give me poverty so when I eat... My stomach is still growling and rumbling or I'm in pain or whatever you feel when you're hungry. You see, I don't want that either. Notice here it says, feed me with food that is needful for me. In the Berea and Study Bible it says, keep falsehood and deceit far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with, with the bread that is my portion. So you have a portion. If you eat a pound of food per meal, I don't know. I can't remember. I keep forgetting what is it the average person eat? But you say you're going to eat, you know, 800, 800 calories. No, say you're going to eat 700 calories per meal or 800 calories or whatever you eat per meal. He says here, just give me 800 calories per meal. If you need $2,000 to live on, he said, just, I just need 2000 If you want to throw me an extra 500 so I can save some, go ahead. Whatever it is. He said, just give me that amount. I don't need to be huge. Notice here, keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion again. So one says food, one says bread. So whatever is your portion, that's what you need. It, and that's a good place to be in. Not overreaching or underreaching. Not living a fake life, but living a life that is real. So I don't have to show off on anybody and fake that I'm something that I'm not because that is on an unbalanced life. I don't have to be lying to, you know, spread falsehood on others or about myself. I just want to, I, I, you see, that's the thing too. When you're living in a balanced life and you're living in the middle, you're less prone to have to fake. You know, you don't have to be something that you're not because you you not have to pretend to be something that you're not. You don't have to pretend to be poor and begging. You don't have to pretend that you're rich and you're, you know, you're living so large. It takes the pressure off. And that to me is if you look at, wow, well, often thought, if you look at everything I talk about this week, you quickly know that, you will not quickly know, but I quickly know because I always think about life this way, that when you're in the middle on any issue, whether it be health, politics, religion, you know, your motive, your aim and ambitions, and like what I'm talking about here, not living a fake life or not um, living an inconvenient life. You're less, you're more pushed in the middle. So you don't have to always have that pressure on you. See, to me, when you're poor, 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 there's a pressure that you have. 
and the pressure is is nature and nurture social and your physical body is under pressure because you're hungry but when you're rich you, you always have to keep up and you, you have to always that maintenance and i'm going to show you in a second why i say that and so there's a pressure but we're in the middle and you can pay your bills you can do what you have to do it takes the social the spiritual all that pressure off and you can just you know relax you don't have to be faking and acting and prideful and want people to believe that you're more than you are you know i'm i'm just who i am i have to fake it and there's less pressure a lot of people in life the cares of this world and the burdens of trying to keep up with the jones and trying to match the world's standards is destroying them because they always have to show that whatever and if something go bad it destroys them because now they can't maintain but it's okay to get knocked off your game i get knocked off my game all the time many times it's okay because I, I wasn't showing off but when you show off and you get knocked off your game it's embarrassing Notice in Proverbs 23, verse 5, Proverbs 23, verse 5, it said, Will thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. So here's the problem with that. Riches fly away. If you set your heart in riches and your intention in life is you want to be large. If the money goes that's when many people go right through the window and land on their head. They just kill himself. Because that's all they live for. But if you're just looking for convenience, you know, I've seen over the years those who live and they just try to live within a convenient way. When economic crash comes and all that, they're not as affected. And sometimes not affected at all. Because they're not in the game. They're in a different game. So you want to be in a different game. When you're in that game where you're just convenient, wherever stage you're at, because that's what Paul basically teaches, wherever stage you're at in life, you try to be in the middle. Because when upheavals come, it don't matter. See, it matters, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect. There's things I talk about, and some I believe that I'm all invested in the conversation. I'm not really invested. I'm, a, 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 I'm a, 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 I would say, like a social scientist. I'm just looking at these things. I'm less emotionally invested than probably what I give on the talk. I'm invested in a social observational way. You know, that's just the reality. See, see, if, if I'm not part of any community, I'm part of my church community. So if I talk about a community, somebody might think, oh, he's invested in that community. I'm not. Because that those communities live in extremes, I'm not part of the general population socially. I should say, I live here, but I'm not part of the general. But in a social way, I'm not vested in any type of Hispanic, Black, White, Asian culture. I'm not invested in none of those cultures. I'm not part of those cultures. So it when they go to extreme, it don't bother me. I'm just observing. Yeah, this is what's going on in society. I'm not invested in it. You know, when people fight back and forth about vaccine and all these medications, I'm not invested in it because I'm not using it. I'm not part of it. I just talk about it as a, as a sometimes my interest piece and just to to know what's going on. Because uh, you're trying to be in the middle. So when people are going after money, as this text say, and they give it their all, and that money takes wings and fly away at the economic crash, or at uh, um, a downturn in a per certain industry and this is all their life is about they don't spend no time with their family they don't really enjoy even the property that they have because many people have so much property that they really never enjoy it they don't work on the property they don't have they just spend time fixing and building and getting things ready to never use it but if you're convenient you have enough time look think to me if you have to work a certain amount of hours each week the further you get above 40 hours each week is the less you can enjoy the, 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 the rewards of your earnings. The further you get out, you know, so you, this, when you start hitting those, you know, 60, 70, 80, uh, some people going even 100. Yeah, you're making money. But are you really enjoying it? Can you really enjoy a billion dollars worth of assets? 
houses all over the world while trying to make more money to maintain those houses. So there's a certain point where is is like they, they talk about is like a critical mass. Is a certain point, and that's not even a fra- proper phrase, but it's a phrase that all of a sudden slipped me. But it's a a, a, a certain point where it, you 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 go beyond equilibrium, like what I'm talking about with homeostasis or balance in the health. There's a certain point where things get a little too hot, it doesn't work for us. If we get a little bit too cold, it doesn't work for us. We're inconvenient. And I say this right here. I was planning to say it later. We are creatures of comfort. God made us this way. We It's not our choice. It is God that made us to be very easily inconvenienced. He's the one that made us. That the, the, the temperature that we are convenient at is very is a very narrow band you know so i know um i think it's 70 something degrees give and take a few degrees and you know because we put out heat we're we're generator of heat and then the outside temperature affects us so because we are generating heat if it's too cold it's a problem if it's too hot it's a problem we're very easily inconvenient. Um, we have to eat how many meals a day as we go. Very inconvenient. If we get if we get too out of shape, it starts to negatively affect our bodies. If we're too ignorant, it negatively affect our body, our brain, and our social status. But then Solomon say um, in Ecclesiastes that too much learning and too much reading of books can be a waste of time and too much. There's a point where you put the book down and go go ride your bicycle. Go for a walk in the park. There's a certain point where you put the work down and go ahead and enjoy a meal. You know what I'm saying? They, they, you can't, you never always work. You have to stop and eat. We're creatures of comfort. We're creatures of convenience. And when we get into that mindset, you start to see the things the Lord says is the better way. But you could have so much property that you, you, you just just think about the amount of work it takes to maintain your one property that you have, even if it's an apartment. I know. Think about it. Where you have a property in Florida, you have a property somewhere in um, California, in the Northeast, you have a property over there somewhere in probably the Caribbean, you have a property in Europe somewhere, and you have all those properties to monitor, look over, travel to. Whatever that alone can be a task. Now somebody say, "Oh, but that would be great. I'll be able to fly on my own property." But think about how many times you're gonna fly to France or England or one of those countries. How many times while working? How long are you gonna stay? And then if you have five, six properties around the globe, how long are you gonna stay at each property while working? Have your main property that you work out of and live out of. So after a while, it becomes. A task in itself towards the pipe break, the dis. And you always have to be or oh, get a get a contractor in there. Make sure you're secure. Contractor secure the property. Make sure they don't steal anything out of your house. None the paintings and the art. That can be a very inconvenient way to live. All of a sudden, the properties become your master and you are the slave. But in life, it's that you're supposed to have everything in your life that serve you. And you don't serve them. When you start to serve them, something is wrong. It's junk. You need to get it out of your life. It's unnecessary. Everything is supposed to serve you, not supposed to you serve it. So that's convenience. If you look real quickly here at Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. Genesis 3, verse 5. This is a serpent talking to Eve. It says, For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That's very tempting. You know, I've heard people with this type of talk. The Bible says that God made us a little lower than the angels, right? So we're not way lower than the angels. We're a little lower than the angels, the Bible says. But you could get into your mind now where, notice he didn't say you can be like me. You can be like an angel. You can be like gods. Um, So how far is that? A created being start thinking they're gods. Now we're made higher than the animals, but we're made lower than the angels. He said, forget about us. You can be even higher than us. You can be way up there with the man upstairs. You can be just like him. You see, it, it, it is this thing where pride makes you miss the blessing you have and forget to be humble. This is where pride got Eve. It is that prideful concept where we don't want to be just convenient. Remember, we're, we're, not, we're not even at the level of angels. And that's a significant thing. Just enjoy what you have. 
many times we are grasping for things that, hey, look, are you going to be a God? And some are like, yeah, I want to be a God. Or, you know, you see people in a society talk about people who are GOAT, G, capital G-O-A-T, talk about this person is a God. You know, that person is a God. And you'll be like, no, he's a human being. Hey, we're not at that level. Just a regular human being that have to do regular stuff. As I say, get hungry like everybody else and get inconvenient like everybody else. But some people want this lifestyle that you think, is this person a God? You think about the Egyptian Pharaoh. He was a God in his mind. But God says, I'm going to bring you down. I'm going to remind you that you know God. Think about the king of Tyrus. Think about these various uh, different entities or human beings over throughout history. These leaders like Hitler and these various different leaders that run these very pagan countries, they come to a point where they think, I'm a god. And God says, mm. and you might think that because you have so much. You're so powerful, so to speak. But I'm going to bring you down. I'm going to remind you, you're just a man. And that's why it's so hard, I believe, for people who are very filter rich to serve God because they, they literally think, I'm a god. And this is what happened to Eve. She believed it for a second. And she's like, I'm going to do it. And then God says, I'm going to show you who you are. Watch what's going to happen. I'm going to kick you out of here. I'm going to get rid of this tree from you. You can't get to this tree. Are you going to see how quickly you have to put on some clothing? Because you're going to freeze to death. I'm going to show you that nature is above you. That you know God. I'm going to show you that says if I turn, if, 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 and the tornadoes start to roll through, a whole bunch of dead bodies are mashed up properties. All your little house is just like garbage. Everything that you have, you know, yeah, it might not be a, sh a shed or, or a, a tent, but you know God. But you, may be, you go to so many people, you can't tell them that. They might not say it in this way, that they believe that they're gods. But their attitude, you think, yeah, this person thinks there's a God. And God said, I'm going to touch your body. You remember, I think it with, with Herod. God said, I'm going to touch you one time. I'm going to send my angel. I'm not going to touch you. I'm going to send my angel to touch you one time. You're dead. You're nothing. You're like a worm. Um, but that's what it is. We can think too highly of ourselves and think this is what I should have. And God said, no, you, I didn't make you like that. You're made like in my image, but I didn't make you like that. I didn't even make you to the level of the angels. Calm yourself down. It's the same problem Lucifer ran into. And look what end up happening with us because of him. Notice in Deuteronomy 31 verse 21. Deuteronomy 31 verse 21. It says, And it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles shall befall in them. This is talking about children of Israel. That this song shall be test, shall testify against them as a witness. For it shall not be forgotten out of the mouth of their seeds. For I know that their imagination which they go about even now before I brought them into the land which I swear to them. So the imagination that they brought about. And so he's saying, look, I know their mindset. This is their mindset. Their mindset is they have these kind of imagination. They imagine these things. And because they imagine these things um, that He's saying, look, I know their imaginations. I know what they're thinking about. And I know what it is. Um, and look at verse 20. <laughs> look at verse 20. It says, for, we jump back. So he's saying, look, remember a lot of things about Moses wrote was like a song, right? So he's saying, look, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen before it happens. And I'm telling this so that some of you probably will read this and say, wow, look, whatever is happening, Moses I prophesied it and so that hopefully some will repent. But look at verse 20. Look at what he was referring to. Verse 20 now. It says, For when I shall when sorry, for when I shall have brought them into the land which I swear to their fathers, that flow it with milk and honey, and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxen fat, then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant. So you see what's happening there. He's saying, look, I know your imaginations. I know what you all imagine. This is what you want. And I'm telling you, you're going to do this. And what's going to end up happening? You all going to forget me. 
you're all going to get fat, he says. Eat milk and honey and get fat and forget God. Because you, I'm sending you to a land with milk and honey. But ironically, I'm telling you that you need to maintain um, your ways before me and not eat and get fat. Now imagine that. It's, you see, that's the interesting thing in life. Because the problem in life, I think now, with this text, Deuteronomy 31 verse 20, is we have desire, the desire and the, the, is put there by God. God also always wants us to investigate. God always wants us to have ambition. So it's a natural inclination that's put there by God, but it got perverted and, you know, the devil took advantage of it and messes up. So here we are, we messed up, but Christ come to us and said, look, I want to bless you, right? I want to bless you, but I don't want you to make it get to your head. And that's to me is the, the most, it's a fascinating thing. Because remember, God put Adam and Eve in a garden. And God says, I'm going to bless you, Adam and Eve. I blessed you. But I want you to get prideful. And that to me is the, it's a difficult walk to walk. Because I always notice with human beings, if you treat them nice, they take it, oh, you're weak. And they abuse you and disrespect for you. You'd be like, what's wrong? I don't get it. But then I started thinking about God and say, oh, it's similar with God and us. Because God wants to bless you and prosper you. But God don't want you to get to your head. And that's the problem. And for us, yes, he said, look, I'll lead you in a better way. But don't forget me when you're blessed. I want to give you bread that's convenient. But I don't want you to be like uh, cocky and losing your mind and thinking you're God. You're not God. I don't want you to forget the poor, forget the less fortunate. I just want you to live a balanced life. And that's where the problem comes in because, as you know, when they, I always say when there's money on the table, people get silly. People lose their moral scruples. When they see money, they get excited. Oh, there's more money, I'll take more. Uh, they won't say, I'll give somebody some of the money. So God says, no, I don't want you to be like that. I want you to share. I want you, if you, I bless you, bless somebody else. Don't oppress people. Don't, and especially, please, don't oppress the poor, the fatherless, and the widow because I'll beat you up. I'll take it away. And this is the story of Israel. People say, why are you talking about some of these things I talk about? Because of the story of Israel. It's so clear that if you say you're blessed, God says, take care of the poor. If you don't take care of the poor, I'm here to warn you, you're making a mistake. And some people are like, I don't want to hear that. They don't listen to me. Because yeah, this is what I'm going to talk about. I'm sending you, God says, into a land of milk and honey. Remember, don't get cocky. Don't get full of yourself. Take care of people who are less fortunate. Else I'm going to take it away. I'm going to make that money fly away. I'm going to send curses in your life. I'm going to touch you and remind you that, hey, look, here's some cancer for you. You're a human being. You're not God's. You're not even angels. I'm going to touch you. You're going to go broke. I'm going to touch you. Your land going to turn to desert. I'm going to touch you. And, you know, just your whole family going to start killing themselves. You are not God. You got too cocky. That's why I talk about these things. Because you, somebody can misunderstand blessing and saying, because I'm blessed, that means I have a right to beat people up. That's the story of Nebuchadnezzar. And God said, hey, look, I'm going to make you eat grass. Because you're not taking care of the poor. He didn't say I'm going to make you grasp because you don't have the right doctrines. I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to give you seven years of punishment because you don't you don't preach against this fallen church or that fallen church. I said, I'm going to make you grasp because you don't take care of the poor. And that's important. We got to live in the bias, but we want to get so filter rich, we'll oppress the poor to get rich. And so one extreme is abuse and the other extreme. You see, it's those who are filter rich. So to make sure that the bottom half of the society is taken care of. But they're like, no, their money is going to be hoarded in the bank. So this was a story of Israel. Important to note. So give me neither poverty nor riches, but convenience. And when you have convenience, you don't have to rebuff nobody. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 through 11. 1 Timothy 6, verse 6 through 11. Same thought here again. Notice here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. We literally could stop there. I'll read the rest of it, but we could stop there. This is beautiful for this text. Such a beautiful companion text. 
when you live godly and you content contentment is great gain when you you say god give me just my portion give me just food that i'm satisfied don't let me have to lie and steal and i'm good don't let me have to live fake i'm good i just want to live a real simple life i want to be able to have my portion in this life so but godliness with contentment is great gain some may say you mean you could be just convenienced and you're good yeah as a matter of fact, I mentioned um, this whole idea of people because when I was young, all these different thoughts about supercars, um, yachts, all that type of stuff. Uh, before I ever drove a car, hmm. you drive in a car but never drove one. And then, you know, you drive one, you realize, wait a minute, a four cylinder car could get out of control. So, anyhow, so you get to these things with these properties. You know, you think somebody have a property in France or London or, and they're living that life. Okay. And then you start to realize that property is an issue. And then all of a sudden, a few years ago, quite a few years now, these guys came up or gals came up with this idea of Airbnb where you could just go rent somebody's property. And then you say, wait a minute, this is even better than a hotel. And then now a lot of the hotels are refurbishing and they're making their hotels where they're eating up room space and they're making their hotel rooms less room some of these places or they're building brand new hotels like this and it's more like a studio apartment or like a one bedroom apartment and that has really changed the game because remember the aim is convenience your is a hotel is somewhere for hospitality it's the hospitality industry i'm wondering if soon hospitals would do that where you can go to a hospital and then you can have somewhere to warm food up and stuff. <laughs> so if somebody bring you food, you could eat in your room. But anyhow, so <laughs> when you think about that, it's all to do with convenience because you're when you travel, you're dis, you're you're inconvenienced. And more and more, the hospital industry is kind of going along because there are people have dietary restrictions, there are people have dietary choices. You know, people have diabetes and all these things, and they're very particular about what they eat. There's people have food allergies, so people will travel with their food. I know people travel with even um, rice cookers. People travel with blender. I travel with a blender almost most of the time when I travel. And why? Because of my convenience. I want food to my convenience and a lot of these moves. So now you could you could be somebody and be like, say you're not gonna go nowhere outside of your local area for more than a week or two, and you want to be convenient. You don't have to go own a property you could just go do an airbnb and just own it you know look i sometimes travel with i have these pillowcases no, not the pillowcase but below the pillowcase my pillowcase on a normal basis i have um a hyperallergenic waterproof um you can buy them online this hyperallergenic waterproof pillowcase so you put it on the pillow and you put the pillowcase on top of that and i sleep with that all the time I use that because I have allergies so I always use and many time I travel I bring it I don't I don't be sleeping on the pillow I try not to sleep on a pillowcase that's in the hotel room I use that barrier on the pillowcase and then I travel with that so um, for my convenience it's just it's just kind give me what is for my convenience I don't want like to be sneezing and having runny nose so I try to do for my convenience so you could go somewhere and you could be in so and you could have your own bed in you could, you could do whatever you want for your convenience and go to extremes um and then but you're a convenience and so i say that because as i say when i was younger um because of what i was seeing in the magazines i think you know this is the life but then i realized wait a minute if i have to buy a car like uh, i can't remember the car but i'm seeing a car in my head you buy a certain car a nissan gtr and you have to spend like 10 grand to ten thousand dollars to do like a basic maintenance or, or certain thousands of miles you have to do a maintenance and you spend 10000 So now that's 10 more thousand dollars I have to do for basic maintenance. And I could have a car that, uh, most cars you're never going to go above 90, 100 miles anyhow unless you're going on a track. Give me what is for my convenience. And I'm totally happy with that. That's what I've learned. And I think especially young people need to be taught that. You don't need that stuff. And you don't even want that stuff because that stuff is a lot of headache. You just want stuff that you're convenient. 
that you're not inconvenienced. And that's it. Can't overemphasize that point. Mm -hmm. uh, I take a few more texts. So notice here it says, but those who fall into evil are familiar with this text. That's why I didn't want to go through all of it. But I read this verse 7 and 8. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us dare bid we be content. So the, the Bible teaches contentment, convenience. Not to be pauperous poor and not to be super rich. Just right in the middle. Most of the prophets and patriots, they were in the middle. And if they were not in the middle all the time, it was because um, they they were persecuted or some other reason. But it's just a majority of them. And, you know, you can come to a point where you have a lot, but you don't live like you have a lot. That was Abraham's story. He had a lot and didn't live like he had a lot. Notice here in Genesis 28, verse 11 through 22. I'm going to read this whole thing here because it's a story here, um, a concept that you need to get along this line. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but convenience. It's, to me, being convenient is great. I could be in a situation where it's, you know, it's 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 in a remote area. Like I've been, you know, where I go on a waterfall or something, and it's in a remote area in the bush. But you have some food, you have water to drink, you feel safe, and you're happy. And there's no modernity. There's no cell phone tower. There's nothing in the middle of nowhere. If, a, if the vehicle breaks down, you can't even walk out of it because you don't even know where you're at. But you're convenient. It's, everything is there. You have some food, you're happy. And life is good. <laughs> Notice in verse twenty, uh, verse eleven of chapter twenty-eight of, of Genesis. This is the story of Jacob here, and he lighted, um, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set, and he took um, of the stone of that place and put them for a for his pillow and laid down in the place to sleep. Sleep. So that would be. Not hyper, it would be hypergenic, all right, but it would not be comfortable. But he's sleeping, but he's looking for something, he wants something. Now he dreamed, and um, behold, a ladder set up upon the earth, and on top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. So we pause there. Later on, Christ in the New Testament, and how much years later, say, He is that ladder, He's the source where people can. The angels can go and come to bless. Without him, the angels don't bless, so to speak. And verse 13, it says, Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, God of Abraham, thy father, and God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest, for thee will I give it and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the mount and to the north star and to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Lord repeat the blessing to him. And the blessing that Lord repeat to him is a blessing that he gave to his father, his father's father before that, to Abraham. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places where thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken. To D off. So this is a different um, philosophy of convenience because one thing I've learned um, here in this life is that I could have bread to the full. I could have, uh, you know, comfort where I sleep or my head. I could have all that. But I remember there's a point in my life I realized all of that is there, but if the spiritual aspect is not settled, I'm not settled. Very important. And it started teaching me that even this idea here of being balanced, being in the Lord, there's more to it than just saying, you know, how would I say this? There's more to it than just saying, you know, because a person could have all the food they can eat, not too much, not too little, could have everything, but their soul ain't right. And so Jacob wanted to settle this issue because as I say, life is more three dimensional. It's not just your mental capacity, your social, so forth. So he says, I'll bless thee. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places where thou goest and bring thee again to this land. That's what you want, to know that God is with you. Amen. And Jacob awake out of his sleep and he said, Surely 
the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. Right? And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is the pl is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Hope you catch that. Right? Now you imagine you're the place. And rock the rocks were your pillow, the stone was your pillow. You lay your head down. Total inconvenience. You, there's nothing, you don't even have a nice blanket to put over you. You don't have a nice pillow, you don't have hyperallergenic pillow. You don't have pillars that are made from bamboo fiber. You don't have none of that stuff. You know, you don't have, you know, memory foam to lay on, none of that. Quilted, none of that. And all of a sudden, God says, and you see a ladder going up and down, God speaks to you. And you say, wow, this place is, is uh, let me read it again. <laughs> he says, how dreadful is this place? Now, when he went there, it wasn't dreadful. But because God was there. God was in the house, so to speak. God was at that place. He said, this is now the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. This is where, if you want to get to heaven, and that's why later on he called it Bethel. You, you go through here. And I realized that there's more to life than simply material possession. There's more to life than simply, even I would say, convenience. Because you see, he was inconvenient. He was in an inconvenience, in inconvenient way. But the moment he realized that it changes everything. And and one thing I learned from it, and I say this to you, that what I get from this, and I'm finished reading yet. I'm going to try to finish reading before we close here. One thing I get from this is that sometimes it's perspective. It's perspective. You see, you could be poor and because the blessing of the Lord is upon you and you have food to eat you're poor in this world material goods you don't even know you're poor and you're quite happy and you could see a person have money that more than they can spend and they decide they're not happy and they want to finish themselves and then you sort of realize that says we well, see when the Lord is in the house the Lord bless you you learn to be satisfied with what you have you learn to see what you have and appreciate what God has blessed you with. And it is perspective. And as I say, I'm not talking about a person who's so poor that they could die tomorrow because they have no food to eat. I'm talking about a lot of people who are the majority of the world who have food to eat or whatever. They can be so unthankful because God is not in their lives. God does not bless them and so they're greedy for gain because they think more is going to make them better. It's going to make them more secure. But remember, he says, Lord said to him, wherever you go, I'll be with you. That's security. God said, I'll secure you. And God ended up securing him everywhere he went. There's just more I could preach on this, but I'm running out of time. So I'll just keep reading here so I can close it out. And it says, And Jacob rose early in the morning and took stone that he put for his pillow and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon it, on the top of it. So all of a sudden, this this stones that was a source of really inconvenience his perspective chain and you see these stones as wow something for worship and he called the name of the place bethel but the name of the city was luz at the first and jacob vowed a vow saying if god will be with me praise the lord and will keep me in this way that i go praise the lord i will give and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on he said, look, I just need some bread and some raiment because I have God. This is what Paul says in 1 Timothy. He says, look, we just we didn't come, come to the world with nothing. We have some food and we have some clothing. We good. This is this is Paul quoting here, Jacob. And you know, you have to if you have some little food and some clothes, man, thank the Lord. And when you start get to that place, you start to realize that at every stage of your life, if you have just enough to keep you convenient, you could be convenient. You know, hang, you know, as I say, just rooming with somebody. You can be convenient in your own apartment. You can be convenient in your own house. You don't have to have all that. And you're totally happy because God is with you. And the place where you are at with God, it is better. It's the gate of God. And one of, that's one of the things I learned, you know, that I realized no matter where I'm at, if I'm in a church and a church is just, I feel like the devil is here. It's just whatever I have, is it takes away the, the, the blessings of the Lord. But when you in, we, we are better. 
it just I'll read the last verse because I could just keep going on. This is powerful. So that that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar, it was a it was something for a, a pillar. No, it's a pillar. Shall be God's house. Mm -hmm. And all that thou shall give me, I will surely give the tent unto thee. Notice how his attitude changed. The pillar, the pillow, sorry, became a pillar. And he sees a pillar of something great. The area that he was laying at, that he saw it as just probably rocks and stuff. It's now a house of worship. It's the gate to heaven. And he now says, look, you bless me, God. I'm not going to forget you. I'm going to give you 10%. There's many people, multi-millionaires, they have never in their life given even tithe of what they, they, they give to the gospel or to the poor because the attitude is different. So, again, you can be convenient, but the one thing that is key that's missing, make sure that you have God. Because when you have God, you can enjoy whatever you have right now and you can be convenient with where you are right now. As long as you have food and raiment, you're good. Even if you, you're living with somebody, a roommate with somebody, you're good. I'll read this to close. And this is a, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. After this manner, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, this will go along with verse 7, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you and thanks for listening to Revive Reform Radio. Looking forward to talking to you again live on Monday morning when we shall do motivation. Until then, I pray that you may continue to walk with the King. Mm -hmm.